The way the game of evolution works is that organisms that do a good job of passing their genes on to the next generation, in other words, organisms that manage to survive and reproduce more successfully, the next generation has more of their genes and therefore has more of their traits. The next generation is more like them. And we know that organisms that face different obstacles to surviving and reproducing end up evolving different traits to deal with those obstacles. Men and women, as we discussed in class, face very different obstacles to reproduction. The main obstacle for women is really her own limited ability to have kids. Every nine months maximum, probably less frequently than that in our evolutionary past. Men, on the other hand, could potentially have several kids a day. The limiting factor for them is really access to the limited reproductive resources of the opposite sex of women. So you could imagine that since the two sexes face very different obstacles to maximizing gene transmission, that they might have evolved different strategies for selecting mates or uh, mating strategies generally. Studies looking at the behavior and the self-reports of women across cultures find that in general women, more so than men, want to maximize parental investment. For example, they report desiring about half the number of sexual partners as men at every time interval. So if you ask people, okay, how many sexual partners would you like to have over the course of the next half a year, year, and so forth, women tend to report desiring fewer. Why is that? Well, you could imagine if women want to maximize parental investment, then a good way to do that would be to sort of focus their resources and their efforts on a single partner who could provide that parental investment. Men, on the other hand, might prefer more partners because it would increase the chances of their genes being passed on to the next generation. Women rated themselves less likely to have sex than men at every time interval less than five years. So in other words, they would ask people, how likely are you to have sex with your partner after a week, a month, a year, and so forth? At any interval less than five years, women reported they were less likely to do so. Across cultures, women more so than men value cues to a potential mate's ability to acquire material resources. So for example, evidence of career ambition, professional degrees, current wealth, women tend to report these things as being more important to them than men do in a potential mate. The idea here is that choosing a father who's likely to be a good provider may aid a woman while she's pregnant or caring for a small child. This is less of an issue in our modern society, but you could imagine this could be a serious issue in early hunter-gatherer societies. Women who were pregnant or are nursing would have had a much harder time securing the resources they need to survive, as well as protection that they might need. Men, on the other hand, tend to prefer more partners than women. There's evidence that they're more likely to engage in relationships outside of their primary relationship. And they tend to prefer younger partners. They also tend to prefer partners with specific bodily proportions. So across cultures, regardless of what general size that culture finds attractive, men across cultures seem to prefer a specific waist to hip ratio. And it turns out that that waist to hip ratio is actually associated with increased fertility, increased likelihood of successfully bearing children. Both youth and these specific bodily portions are correlated with higher fertility. Now, it's important to understand that all these preferences that I'm describing here, while people report them consciously, they don't have to be consciously aware of the reasons for them. And really, they don't even have to be aware that they have these preferences in order for the preferences to work. If you think about a fruit fly, for example, they have relatively few neurons. They're really a collection of instincts and reflexes, but they do just a fine job of finding food, avoiding predators, finding mates, and so on and so forth. Now these fruit flies, I seriously doubt they're flying around thinking, boy, I'd, I'd really like to uh, find a partner with certain traits so that uh, I can maximize the chances of passing my genes on to the next generation. They don't have to. They don't have to be aware of the strategies and the preferences in order for them to work, in order for them to increase the chances of passing genes on to the next generation. When men or women look at other individuals that they find sexually attractive, they don't necessarily have to be thinking about passing genes on to the next generation in order for that attraction to increase the likelihood of passing genes on. Why might men have these preferences? 
Again, these latter two are associated with fertility. There are also interesting differences in patterns of jealousy between men and women. In studies like this, they'll often ask people in long-term relationships to imagine their partner having either an intimate sexual relationship or an intimate emotional relationship with someone else. Men tend to report being more bothered by the sexual infidelity, and they also have higher galvanic skin response, that palm sweating response that's an index of sympathetic arousal, the fight or flight response. Women, on the other hand, tend to be more bothered by the idea that their partner is having an intimate emotional relationship with someone else. Now, of course, both sexes tend to be bothered by both types of infidelity. It's just that the degree of discomfort varies between men and women. The explanation here is that, for men, sexual infidelity could lead to paternity uncertainty. In other words, there's maybe an innate predisposition to be worried about sexual infidelity because it could result in you providing for children that are not your own, and thereby reducing the likelihood of your own genes being passed on. Women, on the other hand, are always sure that their children are their own. There's no such thing as maternity uncertainty. For women, the logical explanation here is resource security. So for women, emotional infidelity could be an indication that their partner is sharing resources, physical resources, with their partner. And therefore, there would be fewer of those limited resources for the woman herself or her children. Interestingly, there's a wide variation across cultures in how accepting people are of infidelity, uh, cheating on their partners, in other words. But there are no cultures that we know of where infidelity is more acceptable for women. In other words, it always tends to be overlooked more for men than for women. Again, this is sexual infidelity, and it fits with this general explanation. Men may be more bothered by the sexual infidelity than women are. But are these preferences still at work? So when we give people questionnaires and ask them about these things, they report differences in preferences. But we also have these very complex social structures and institutions that dramatically shape our choices in our lives and our behaviors. So it may be that these preferences are no longer actually playing a role in our lives. There's some evidence that they are, though. First, there's a positive correlation between a woman's physical attractiveness and the occupational status of her husband. In other words, attractive women tend to have husbands with higher incomes. This can be explained if you think about it in this way, that women with valuable resources, cues to fertility, use them to acquire resources valuable to them, physical resources. In one classic study, they had an attractive female experimenter approach men on a college campus in Ohio and ask them a series of questions leading up to the question of whether the male interviewee would go back to her dorm room and have sex with her. 75% of the men in that study agreed to have sex with the attractive female experimenter. They did the same thing with an attractive male experimenter approaching women on the same campus, and not a single one of the women approached agreed to have sex with the attractive male experimenter. Now, there are lots of factors that could play into this, but it's at least consistent with the idea that men are more likely to engage in sexual behavior with multiple partners. The most common reason for divorce worldwide is actually female infidelity, again, consistent with the idea that men are strongly predisposed against this. That's not true in the U.S., though. Interestingly, in the U.S., the most common reason for divorce is actually financial disagreements. But are these theories really true? Can we really explain these observed differences in mating strategies between men and women as evidence of evolution acting on our innate predispositions? There are some pros and cons to this. Some argue that what the experimenters here are doing is really just generating and testing hypotheses that we already know are true. Uh, we already know that men and women tend to be different, and it could be cultural, but we're setting up the experiment to make it seem like we're testing a different hypothesis. In other words, although mating habits of people can be explained in terms of increasing the probability of passing on their genes, you can't necessarily assume a genetic basis. People learn. Behaviors and preferences can be a product of learning. You don't need to observe too many women marrying a bum to realize that you don't want to marry a bum. <laughs> what would be nice is if we had evidence for genes that influence these preferences. 
Now, when I first started teaching this class, we didn't have that evidence. Now we do. By the way, here's a link to the website for David Buss's lab where you can see some of the, uh, the survey instruments that have been used for the research I've been discussing. So, back to evidence for genes playing a role in this. This is a vole. They're little rodents that live in different parts of the world. Specific species of these, known as prairie voles, pair bond for life. They find a mate, they have sex with that mate, and then they stay together for the rest of their lives, raising kids and having more kids. It turns out, though, that that pair bonding requires a neurotransmitter and hormone called vasopressin. Vasopressin gets released into the bloodstream and into parts of the brain after sex, both in males and females, and both in prairie voles and humans. It turns out, if you block the release of vasopressin in the male prairie vole's brain, you get no pair bonding. In other words, they can mate with a partner, but will not pair bond with that partner like they normally would. Likewise, you can inject vasopressin into male prairie voles while they're in close physical proximity to a female, but without mating. And the male will again pair bond with that female prairie vole, even without sex. And as I mentioned, prairie voles are monogamous for life. The pair bonding tends to be very effective when it occurs. They have lots of vasopressin receptors in their reward areas. One explanation for this is that the presence of the vasopressin after mating stimulates these reward areas. These are the same ones that are involved in addiction and may underlie the pair bonding. Montane voles, on the other hand, are another species of voles and they tend to be promiscuous. The males have a larger physical range that they travel over and they can mate with multiple females within that range. And the montane voles, as might be predicted by the hypothesis I just mentioned, have fewer receptors for vasopressin in their reward areas. But this is just a correlation to know that these vasopressin receptors were really causing the pair bonding you would need to do an experiment where you manipulated this. And that's now been done. They did essentially genetic engineering on the montane voles. They used a viral vector transfer. They essentially hijack a virus to carry the gene for these vasopressin receptors into neurons in the reward areas of the montane voles. The viruses then hijack the cells within the montane voles reward system and those cells then express this vasopressin receptor. After you do that, voila, you get monogamous male montane voles. No word yet whether or not this will work with humans. Although interestingly, there are variations from one person to another in the vasopressin receptor gene. And certain versions of this receptor gene are associated with higher rates of infidelity among human females. So here now, we have direct evidence for genes influencing this kind of behavior, consistent with the general theme of this class, which has been that it's always both genes and environment influencing any given behavior. Okay, let's move on to gender identity. This is different than sex. Sex, someone's sex is related to the physical appearance of their genitals and other physical characteristics. Gender identity, on the other hand, is how you feel. It's how you identify sexually, how you prefer to be addressed and viewed. And of course, we know that this doesn't always match the outside. We also know that all of these variables, sex, how we appear on the outside, how you feel on the inside, these vary. As with everything else in nature, they tend not to come in distinct categories, but rather exist along a continuum. Psychologists once believed pretty strongly that gender identity was mostly a product of rearing and experience. In other words, it wasn't nature, it was nurture. This was really true of most aspects of psychology, especially in the first half of the 20th century when behaviorism was dominant. Even after behaviorism had less of an influence on psychology, psychologists still tended to focus more on environmental influences of behavior than genetic. I think mainly because they didn't really have access to the genes in order to study them directly. But now we have more tools that allow us to do that. And current evidence now strongly suggests that biological factors, especially prenatal hormones, play a large role in influencing your gender identity. There are people whose genitals are physically intermediate between male or female. It's sometimes referred to as having ambiguous genitalia. 
these people, as we'll see, often have a gender identity that doesn't necessarily fit with their physical appearance. This is a bit different from being a, a true hermaphrodite. Uh, although these folks are sometimes often referred to as hermaphrodite, technically a hermaphrodite is someone with both male and female genital tissue, which is a much more rare condition. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH, is the most common cause of intersex. These individuals have an overdevelopment of the adrenal glands before birth. Here's a brief overview of what happens. So they have a genetic defect that results in little to no production of cortisol, which is also a steroid hormone. This, by way of a feedback loop that I'll show you in just a moment, results in overstimulation of the adrenal glands during fetal development. In addition to producing cortisol, the adrenal cortex also produces testosterone. So this overstimulation of the adrenal cortex leads to too much testosterone production, which then causes the female fetus to become partly masculinized. This can occur in male fetuses too, but they're already producing testosterone, so it has a smaller effect. Just as we saw with rats, female human fetuses can become partly masculinized both in their external genitals and also in terms of their behavior. First, let me show you the mechanism for this. We'll revisit this figure again in the next chapter when we talk about emotions. The hypothalamus in the brain produces a locally acting hormone called a releasing factor that induces the anterior pituitary to release ACTH, short for adrenocorticotropic hormone. This travels through the bloodstream to the adrenal cortex, which sits right above the kidneys. The adrenal cortex primarily produces the hormone cortisol, which we'll talk about in the next chapter, but it also produces lower levels of testosterone and a few other hormones. Normally, the presence of cortisol in the bloodstream feeds back to the anterior pituitary. It has receptors for cortisol, and it reduces the production of ACTH. So there's kind of a negative feedback loop. The adrenal cortex starts producing cortisol in response to the anterior pituitary's hormone signal, the anterior pituitary senses the cortisol and says, okay, I've done my job, and reduces the production of ACTH. But in individuals with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, cortisol production is either diminished or abolished altogether. And as a result, there's no feedback signal, and the anterior pituitary produces way too much ACTH, which results in way too much activity of the adrenal cortex, including too much production of testosterone which then masculinizes the fetus. This is showing the genitals of a genetically female baby with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. You can see the labia are sort of enlarged and lumpier, uh, almost like a scrotum, and the clitoris and clitoral hood are much enlarged, almost like a penis. Not only does the increase in prenatal testosterone affect the development of their external genitals, it also affects the development of their brain. So the brains of girls with CAH are also exposed to these high levels of testosterone during prenatal and early postnatal life until the condition is recognized, at which point the physicians will intervene with medications to regulate the levels of hormones. But of course, as we've learned, there are these critical periods of development, and so the effects have already occurred. So how do these changes in brain development show up for girls with CAH? One way is that they tend to show a greater preference for boy-typical toys than do other girls. This has been shown in several studies now. This is just one. In this study, they brought unaffected girls, unaffected boys, and girls with CAH, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, into a room with a variety of toys. Some toys were sort of girl-typical toys, dolls, plates, cosmetic kits, and so forth. Boy-typical toys, including trucks and cars and so forth and also neutral toys, such as games. You can see boys spend about three quarters of their time playing with the boy-typical toys. Unaffected girls without CAH spend about two-thirds of their time playing with the girl-typical toys, and the girls with CAH were somewhere in the middle. They spent almost half their time playing with the boy-typical toys versus uh, maybe a sixth for the unaffected girls, and considerably less time playing with the girls' toys. Now you might be saying, well, it could be that their social interactions, interactions with their parents or brothers and sisters, for example, could be influencing this. For example, the girls with CAH, their parents obviously know that the girls have CAH and may have consciously or not influenced the girls to pay more attention to boy-typical toys. 
Subsequent research suggests that that's not the case. When experimenters observe the interactions between parents and girls with CAH, they tend to treat them very similarly to unaffected girls. There's also good evidence that very, very young children, likely to not yet have assimilated their the cultural norms for boys and girls, also tend to prefer boy-typical and girl-typical toys, so even young babies who are just a few months old. Interestingly, also even monkeys show these same sex differences in toy preference. So if you put young male monkeys and young female monkeys in enclosures with typical human toys for boys, girls, and neutral toys, male monkeys, you can see, tend to spend more time playing with the boys' toys than do female monkeys. And the female monkeys tend to spend more time playing with the neutral toys than the male monkeys. Again, suggesting a strong role for biological factors rather than environmental factors influencing these preferences. Okay, back to girls with CAH. Another influence of this prenatal testosterone on brain development may result in these girls having fewer than average sexual encounters as adolescents. They tend to show less interest in sex, although this may also be related to insecurity about their physical appearance. And they do have a somewhat higher rate of homosexual orientation as adults as well, again indicating an influence of prenatal hormones on the development of important parts of the brain. Another cause of intersex is androgen insensitivity, otherwise known as testicular feminization. The latter term is an older term, and androgen insensitivity is currently the preferred term for this. These are individuals with an XY chromosome pattern, so they're genetically male, but with the genital appearance of a female or ambiguous genitalia. They have normal androgen production. In other words, their Y chromosome causes their gonads to differentiate into testes, which then produce testosterone and other androgens. But they have a mutation in the gene for the androgen receptor. So remember, in order for neurotransmitters or hormones to have an effect on cells, the cells have to have protein receptors for those neurotransmitters or hormones. Because of this mutation, these individuals are insensitive to the testosterone and other androgens flowing through their bloodstream. So the testosterone is there, but the cells just don't know it. They don't get that signal because they don't have the receptor. Depending on the severity of the mutation, the condition can occur in various degrees, from just having a smaller than average penis, all the way to genitals that develop a characteristic female appearance that, from the outside, is indistinguishable from that of an unaffected female. This is showing you pictures of two such individuals. So on the left, these are two pictures of one genetic male with androgen insensitivity, and on the right, another genetic male with androgen insensitivity. And you can see that externally they are indistinguishable from unaffected females. Individuals with androgen insensitivity have mostly normal pubertal changes, these secondary sex characteristics that develop during puberty, such as the growth of breasts, the widening of hips, and so forth, which may be surprising because, as you probably know, those traits develop in response to increased production of estrogens by the ovaries. But as I've mentioned, these individuals have testes instead that produce androgens. Importantly, androgens get converted into estrogens in the body's tissues. There are enzymes that convert testosterone gradually into estrogens. So these individuals are producing lots of testosterone, to which the body is insensitive. But that increased production of testosterone during puberty also results in an elevated level of estrogen during puberty, which in turn triggers these secondary sex characteristics typical of human females. They tend to have a shallow vagina that ends abruptly. Remember that they still have the SRY gene that changes the development of their internal plumbing and causes the undifferentiated gonads to turn into testes. Do they have testes? Yes, we've already mentioned that, so they're producing testosterone. Do they have a uterus or ovaries? Well, they can't have ovaries if the gonads had turned into testes, and they also don't have a uterus, because again, that tends to happen in the absence of the SRY gene. So they do not have a uterus, and they're infertile. You may have noticed in those photographs that I showed you that they had little to no androgenic hair, in other words, pubic hair or underarm hair, which tend to go along with puberty. Why is that? 
So for both men and women, puberty tends to bring on an increase in testosterone. Now, of course, the increase is much greater in males than it is for females. But even in females, there's an increase in testosterone. The growth of pubic hair and underarm hair is driven primarily by the presence of androgens in the bloodstream, both for men and women. Now remember, individuals with androgen insensitivity have androgens, they have plenty of testosterone flowing through their bloodstream, but none of the cells in their body are sensitive to that testosterone, including the cells that make up the hair follicles in the pubic region and under the arms. So those hair follicles don't get the message that they should be producing the coarse dark hair that would normally occur. And they usually have a female gender identity. Why is that? The first answer you might think of is that while they've spent their whole childhood and young adulthood looking like a normal female and being treated like a normal female, and so that's why. And that's probably part of it. We know that social cues and experiences do play a role in just about everything. But as we've also seen, hormones can play a role in brain development as well and have a role in gender identity. Just like the brains of most girls and women, these individuals' brains were not exposed to testosterone and so didn't experience the changes that occur as a result of that testosterone. Their neurons, like every other cell in their body, are insensitive to testosterone, and so they didn't get the message to change. So their brain develops in a, a female typical way. They often undergo a surgery to deepen their vagina to allow for comfortable sexual intercourse, and they usually lead normal, unremarkable lives as typical women. Usually they only notice the condition right around puberty. While their body is changing, they're not developing the androgenic hair and that causes concerns. So they go see their physician, who usually has no idea what's going on, and so sends them to an endocrinologist, who then quickly figures out what's going on. There's other dramatic evidence for the role of hormones in influencing gender identity. Occasionally, there are genetic males who are born without a penis or have their penis accidentally removed. For example, there's a developmental disorder called cloacal extrophy, which results in the penis being either very small or non-existent or sometimes split into two halves that are later surgically combined. At one point, these individuals were almost uniformly reassigned as females. It was easier to reconstruct a vagina than it was to reconstruct a penis. And again, until recent decades, it was believed by most that how you were reared and how you were treated was the most important factor influencing your gender identity. This turns out not to be the case, as evidenced by the fact that these individuals typically never identify fully as being female and feel uncomfortable with their assigned gender identity and often asked to be reassigned as males. In rare cases, there have been individuals who've had their penis accidentally removed. There was a very sad case of a pair of male twins who were taken to be circumcised as babies, and the physician inadvertently burned off the penis of one of the twins by setting the instrument too high. Now, of course, they didn't let the physician touch the other twin, but they were advised that they should reassign the twin who had his penis burned off as a female. He was given a surgery to create something like female genitalia with what was left of the tissue and raised as a girl, but again, never felt completely comfortable as a girl and eventually insisted on knowing the truth, was told the truth, and shortly after puberty adopted a male gender identity and lived the rest of his life as a male getting married, adopting the children of his somewhat older wife, and so forth. The take-home message here is that although hormones don't determine gender identity exclusively, they do clearly play an important role. Okay, let's move on to sexual orientation. In other words, who you're sexually attracted to. Do you think this has a biological basis? What do you think? Is it genes or environment? Hopefully by now you've come to realize that it's always both, and this is no exception. Let me show you some of the evidence here. So let's take a look at this top row first. This was a behavior genetics study comparing monozygotic twins with dizygotic twins. So they recruited homosexual men who were twins and then ascertained the sexual orientation of their twins. So in this study, one of the twins was always homosexual. And the question is, how often was the other twin homosexual? 
Hopefully you remember monozygotic twins share 100% of their genes. Dizygotic twins share 50% of their genes. But both kinds of twin pairs were gestated in the same womb, born at the same time, raised by the parent, same parents, and so forth. So the amount of shared environment between these twin pairs and these twin pairs should be comparable. The main difference between these twin pairs is going to be the amount of shared genetic information, 100% versus 50%. This is showing you the concordance rate. So in other words, when one male monozygotic twin is gay, 52% of the time, at least in this study, the other twin was also gay. Compare that with dizygotic twins. For a gay dizygotic twin, only 22% of the time was the other twin in the pair also gay. So a much lower concordance rate. Why are monozygotic twins more similar in their sexual orientation? It's almost certainly due to the increase in shared genetic information. Something about our genes can influence sexual orientation. We haven't identified specific genes yet, and we may not, and may be a result of such a large number of genes that it's difficult to identify which ones play a role. But nonetheless, there's clearly a genetic influence here. The study also looked at adopted brothers of homosexual men. Now, an adopted brother, of course, would not share 50% of his genes with the homosexual man. They would share only the amount of genes that you would share with any other person in the population. Here, the concordance rate is substantially lower. It's about 11%. Although, interestingly, this is still much higher than the baseline rate of homosexual orientation for men in the U.S. population. It's not clear exactly why this is. Uh, it could be that something about the shared environment between these brothers was more permissive toward or accepting toward a homosexual orientation. They conducted a similar study for homosexual women, and the results were nearly identical. Again, when a monozygotic female twin is homosexual, about half the time the other twin in the pair is also homosexual. For dizygotic twins, only about 16% of the time is the dizygotic twin also homosexual, which is almost exactly the rate for a non-twin sister. Again, these twin pairs and these non-twin sisters share the same amount of genes, about 50%, and they have a similar concordance rate. And again, an adopted sister has a much lower rate. So clearly there's an influence for genes in sexual orientation. But are genes the only factor? Let's look at the data again. Clearly not, because if genes were the only thing influencing sexual orientation, then this concordance rate would be 100% every monozygotic twin pair would have the same sexual orientation. So clearly there are environmental factors that also play a role. We don't know exactly what those factors are. There have been a few that have been identified. But the important thing here is that, again, it's always both genes and environment. How about the effects of hormones? We've seen that hormones can affect gender identity, but what about sexual orientation? Sexual orientation is certainly not related to adult hormone levels. Heterosexual and homosexual adult males and adult females have virtually the same levels of circulating hormones. But there may be an influence from prenatal hormones, specifically testosterone, again during these sensitive periods of brain development before birth. Across species, males that are deprived of testosterone early in life tend to show an increased sexual interest in other males as adults. Similarly, Females, in this case female rats, that are exposed to testosterone during early development show an increased likelihood of mounting behavior similar to male rats. We discussed this a bit earlier. There are also differences in brain anatomy, on average, between heterosexuals and homosexuals. For example, homosexual men tend to have a larger anterior commissure. This is a small, deep tract of white matter that connects the two hemispheres, kind of like a a very miniature corpus callosum. It's also larger in women than in men, on average. They have a larger suprachiasmatic nucleus. Interestingly, preferences for male and female partners vary with time of day, uh, both in animals and in some humans. And they also have smaller neurons, and as a result of smaller overall volume, 
in a part of the brain called the third interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus, or INAH3 for short. This is showing you INAH3, this third interstitial nucleus, in a heterosexual male and in a homosexual male. The little triangles indicate the edges of the nucleus. In a very widely reported and widely discussed study from the early 90s, Simon LeBay and his colleagues conducted post-mortem anatomical investigations of the brains of heterosexual males and females and homosexual males. They looked specifically at the overall volume of the INAH3 in these three groups of individuals. So on the far left, it's showing you the individual heterosexual females and the size of their INAH3 heterosexual males and the sizes of their INAH3, and finally homosexual males and the sizes of their individual INAH3s. So volume is plotted on the y-axis here. You can see for heterosexual women, their average volume was about 0 0.05 cubic millimeters. Though there's a pretty wide range, they tend to cluster around the low end in volume. Heterosexual males had about twice the volume of this particular nucleus. And again, there's pretty wide variation, but they tend to cluster toward the high end. The brains of the homosexual males uh, in this study had an average volume that was about equivalent to that of the heterosexual females in this study. Again, pretty wide variation, but clustering on the low end here. The red dots here indicate individuals who died of AIDS, the blue triangles indicate individuals who died of something other than AIDS. So you can see that all the heterosexual men and this single bisexual man all died of AIDS. But well, the heterosexual men, even the ones who died of AIDS, tended to have a larger volume on average than the homosexual men. Nonetheless, this is a potential confounding factor in that all the homosexual men died of AIDS, whereas very few of the heterosexual men died of AIDS. It may be that AIDS was influencing the volume of this structure. A follow-up study tried to address this. Let's focus on these two groups. So in this study, they had two separate groups that were both HIV positive, but one group was heterosexual, one group homosexual, and again, you found the difference. It's not nearly as large as it was in the previous study, but it's still statistically significant. So in other words, there does seem to be a larger volume for this nucleus in heterosexual men compared to homosexual men. The Simon LeVay study was groundbreaking in that it was the first study to identify clear physical differences in the brains of heterosexual and homosexual men and suggested that biological factors, therefore, could play a role in sexual orientation. But it's hard to tell why these brain differences exist between heterosexual and homosexual men. While it's tempting to interpret the differences in brain structure as causing the differences in sexual orientation, there's really no way to know that. We can't infer the direction of causality, or really any direct causality, between these two things. For example, it could be that something about being homosexual and the behaviors and experiences associated with that actually change brain structure. Alternatively, it could be that the brain structures and the behavior are caused by something else entirely. Possibly a more interesting question, though, is how did evolution bring this about? Presumably, individuals with a homosexual orientation are much less likely to pass their genes on to the next generation than individuals with a heterosexual orientation. So how would genes that predispose individuals toward a heterosexual orientation continue to exist in the population such that something about 5% of adult males in the U.S. are gay? The answer is we don't really know, but there are some possibilities. For example, there's some evidence that the relatives, particularly the female relatives of homosexual men, have more children than the female relatives of heterosexual men. In other words, it may be that genes that predispose men toward a homosexual orientation, and therefore decrease their likelihood of passing on their genes, may actually increase the likelihood of women passing on their genes when those genes are present in women rather than men. And it could be that the benefit that accrues to women 
in terms of reproductive fitness or passing on genes to the next generation actually outweighs the cost of passing on fewer genes when it occasionally produces a homosexual orientation in men. But we really don't know.